You also work uh, in New York City at NYU as an educator. Is this something that you sort of try to bring forward to your students? Is this a recurring theme with them? Uh, well, the, the way that, that art schools work, I guess, is that the, the professor is, is supposed to also be a practitioner and keep, I mean, it's very important video games because I'm trying to teach people the skills of making games as well as kind of teach them how to think about it, how to develop a creative process, how to identify your taste. And if that, that being the case, I have to keep my skills fresh. And one of the reasons that, um, that I want to do a certain number of projects in Unity is that we teach mainly in Unity. And I don't want to ever be in the situation of not being able to, uh, to look at a student's project and, and help them to, to implement what they're doing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just professionally, like, I think it's important that I, that I keep my skills fresh there. And so, yeah, I mean, it was just like, I, in this particular project, actually one of the constraints I had in mind was I wanted to use um, a wide subset of Unity functionality just to kind of freshen up on, the, on those sorts of things. So this is the first time, for example, that I've really used uh, blend trees really, uh, really extensively. Um, it's the first time I've used uh, lighting and 3D materials really extensively. And uh, so part of that was just about what skills did I want to use through the, through the course of the project. In teaching Unity and working with students in Unity, uh, you're, you're encountering Unity in a very unique way. What do you see? What do you see holding back students who are interested in in getting started with game development in Unity? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't I, I don't think any two students are alike. Uh, everybody learns in a different way, and everybody is sort of stumped in, by different things. We get we get students in our master's program, some of whom are really experienced coders as like web programmers or something like that, uh, who or who have C plus plus background. And they find just this enormous uh, number of, of, of visual tools really scary because they're not used to working in that kind of environment. They, they're happy in a code editor and they, they, they can figure everything out from documentation that way. But we get sort of visually minded students who, who are extremely and sort of instantly comfortable within the 3D editor environment and kind of moving things around and animating stuff and throwing in components, uh, but who find the code very, very scary. Uh, I think a good thing about Unity is the, that it's reasonably agnostic to that, right? You can write a game, and this wasn't always true in Unity, by the way, like it was a thing that I know that kind of code uh, friendly people used to complain about, is they just wanted Unity out of the way uh, and they wanted to just write their code and have like a buffer that they could draw to. Uh, but I think that over time, Unity has gotten more and more friendly to a range of different approaches. Uh, and you can you can now work in an entirely visual style uh, as well, and it's that it's that kind of agnostic uh, quality that I think makes it good for beginners because you can help kind of you can, as a, as an educator you can help to to tailor their process to something that makes sense to them that that they can kind of learn easily, and uh, you know it might make sense for them to use a bunch of assets. It might make sense to them to use a visual scripting. Um, and all of that stuff is, is important because I think when you're starting out and making games, the number one thing is the quicker you can get to playable, the less likely you are to get discouraged. Soon as your game can be played, then you can believe that you can make anything at that point. You, like the, the whole, you know, the world is your oyster. If I, could, if I could get this far to the point where it's playable, everything else is just increments uh, up on that. Like little by little, you get more and more of a game. Uh, and it's so easy to convince people of that as well because you can show them the history of uh, from prototype to finished product of commercial games, which often look like student games when they're in like the first prototype stage. Uh, and then it's just a process of, of like iteration and refinement. Uh, so it's just a race. You're in a race against discouragement to get to first playable. Uh, I think that that's where um, working with engines is kind of absolutely amazing and Unity is good from that point of view. That's terrific. Yeah, and I, I, as someone who's struggled to teach myself, I think that uh, I love that concept of a race against dis discouragement. Right. I feel like uh, so many people think of teaching as a kind of a uh, information transfer, right? That we're right. kind of teaching these facts that they're going to assemble into a set of skills, uh, but that so much of it has to do with that kind of motivation and giving people small wins that turn into bigger wins. And Yeah, exactly. I mean, the way Michael Bro puts it in his work, uh, he's got a very famous blog post about prototyping a game uh, or making, doing how to do a game jam, I think it's called. And he's like, you know, the, the main thing is to trick yourself into believing that your game can exist. 
and maybe you're not even making uh, right now. You're not even making the thing that will be the final game. Uh, maybe you are. Uh, maybe you're making something else. But you have to get as quickly as possible to the point where you believe that somehow it exists in the world or it will exist. Uh, we get away from the point where it's still a coin flip, whether there will be a game or there won't be a game. If you can get over that hill, uh, then it's just basically smooth sailing from there. Obviously, that's a simplification, but it's like, I, I really think that, that at least for me and for a lot of my students, that's absolutely the case. It's all about speed. I think that's, uh, I think that's really valuable. Uh, should I, I should also add to that. I mean, it sort of relates to very strongly to the, to the process that I had on getting over it, uh, where, you know, this, this, uh, design methodology of like finding free assets and just sort of throwing them in and kind of just slapping them down and then making adjustments uh, was something that I did quite consciously as a way of, of maintaining speed. You know, I was really, uh, it was really clear in my mind that I had to be fast and free uh, because I didn't want it to I talk a little bit about this in the, in the commentary in the game. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a way in which when you first put down ideas, they're mutable. But when something's been in your game for, for a few days or a week or a month, it becomes very, very difficult to change it. And I really wanted to work in that kind of fluid state where everything could just be changed and I could completely remove a section and completely reconfigure things. And in order to do that, you've got to make sure your process is just extremely rapid. I think that's super interesting and, and definitely true to my experience that you can you kind of put things in, maybe you're thinking of it as a placeholder and then it kind of becomes part of the wallpaper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. It stays there for longer and longer and then you can't even imagine it being Yeah, different. I mean, I talk to, to experienced developers all the time who have some like very, very strange sort of mistake in their game and this is also true for me, uh, that they just can't see anymore because it's been so long because it's just become, as you say, part of the wall, wallpaper and it's like you, you kind of need other people at that point to break you out and make you uh, question the decisions that you made and then it's it's painful to change them and you can never I always say you can never like undecide something you can go back and change your decision but that's different from having never made that decision in the first place you can never get back to the point where you didn't where you were about to decide between two choices or three choices uh, and and you know I, I think that it's just useful to, to think about like how do you develop a process that allows you to uh, to, to kind of try things out before they get locked in that way, before they get decided. Um, and I, I want to have the most sort of fluid and free process possible for that. Yeah, that's super interesting. I think that it's also perhaps more of a challenge developing on your own. Uh, the kind of solo development is something that's become, you know, more viable recently with tools being available. And we see people, I mean, it's been a throughout history, the history of video games, people have made games on their own, but nowadays it's something we see maybe a little bit more, uh, but can be difficult for those reasons. I mean, what you, you mentioned earlier that you kind of were, were quite adamant that you wanted to do this as a solo project. What was your, what was your thinking in that? Well, I mean, I, I, I wanted to make a personal game. I'd been playing a bunch of personal games and it was like, I, I was, uh, I played Nina Freeman's game, Sybil and, uh, and Davy Reardon's game, uh, The Beginner's Guide, which both, both of those were really at the forefront of my mind. And I wanted to make a, a, a game that was a pers like an expression of who I am as a person, where I'm kind of very much uh, in the foreground of the, the game. But I can't, like I was saying this to Nina the other day, actually, uh, I, I don't feel I can, in, in my position, um, do the kind of, like a, like a really, um, raw personal expression of of my lived experience in the way that in the way that that she does with her games like uh, Sybil and, and Kimmy or not Kimmy but uh, how do you do it being the the other one that people know really well uh, or even the kind of really um, sort of deep psychological uh, exposition that Davy did with uh, with the beginner's guide I wanted to, to express my personality uh, through the game without without necessarily making it autobiographical in that way. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, it, in order to do that, it's difficult to really do that in collaboration with other people, right? I wanted, so I wanted every part of the game to be like an expression of my own self. Uh, so that, that's kind of what drives that forward. But, you know, like I think, I think that the ease of solo development comes and goes in cycles quite quite a lot more than people realize. I mean, we all, all talk about how 
you know, obviously the very first games in the 1970s were mostly solo authored. Uh, and then it, in the 90s, it was really starting to be large teams because nobody could figure out how to do 3D. And the technology really comes and goes. I think there was a wave of solo authored games after Cave Story in the mid 2000s. Then it started to get difficult again for a little while. Now I think it's like starting to come back. Uh, it's, it's partly about tools and technology. It's about, uh, it's about know-how and it's about the kind of market uh, position as well. One of the things about making a game by yourself is you don't have to worry about employees and making sure that everybody can live through the course of a, a lengthy development. Uh, and so it's like taking on less financial risk in some ways. But this stuff is, is constantly in flux. And I won't necessarily make a, a, a solo game again as my next project, I think.